I think that probably the motivation to start the podcast is the motivation that has caused or has, you know, prompted Mick, Warwick and myself and and many others actually to to do anything that we do, you know, join Arky team for Warwick. Warwick's also got his blog. Mick is heavily you know, engaged in the small and medium practice forums. And I also started the BOSP over here. It's that we're all desperately searching for this connection where we can just open up and talk about our businesses and, you know, when they're not going well and when they are going well and how someone else has dealt with a certain problem because it's such a an amorphous, crazy beast that to really navigate your way through it, you just you just need advice all the time and it can be such a lonely world those guys have partners and I don't and so I think probably for me to be the only director in Whispering Smith even though I've got the Whispering Smith team and they are phenomenal I'm just that sort of high level director chat is just so valuable and I think that's why we really did it we wanted to have that chat but we wanted to share that chat with as many people as we could and that's why the podcast became the forum Yeah, because you guys were kind of already having these kinds of conversations. So like just for for anybody that's listening that hasn't heard in detail or subscribed to it, which you definitely should, but talking about just a wide range of issues, fee proposals, operational things about running the business, fees, clients, delivering quality projects, like you're just basically covering, it's a real mix, like each episode, even though sometimes they will have a title, like this one's about fee proposals it kind of goes into like a lot of different areas and you guys are just kind of holding it together, which I really, really love. But Occasionally so, someone will step in and, and moderate and go, all right, all right, stop, stop, back to the point. I think it's episode. usually Mick. I feel like Mick's the moderator. He just kind of, he goes, oh, this is getting a bit silly, right? <laughs> sort of. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's really, really good. And so you, you, so it's this sort of this outlet, these conversations. So it sounds like, you know, you're running your practice. Were you feeling like a little bit of a sense of, do, do, do you, do you think it's more about connection and kind of overcoming that sense of isolation when you're running a business or is it kind of like you're hungry for ideas or, or a kind of a combination of the two, you know, and having other people and listening to other architects going through the same things. Like where does it, where do you think the most value comes for you in, in running your business? That's a really good question. There's definitely an, like an, an enormous value in hearing what other people are doing, which I think is the same with your podcast as well. And, but I think that's actually a byproduct. Like that's a, that's a bonus thing that happens on the sideline of you connecting with someone who might be going through what you're going through. Yeah. And I think that is really the reason why we're doing it to be honest. And I knew Mick, I was a student architect and Mick was probably like five or six years. He was actually a grad at the time we worked in this medium practice in Melbourne together. Mm. And so we sort of, you know, ships in the night at that time, I was only there for like a couple of months. I don't even know if I lasted a couple of months to be honest, it may have been weeks. <laughs> And so it was really funny to reconnect with him years later. But yeah, yeah, I, I didn't. Warwick was like, I have these chats with Mick separately and I have also these chats with Kate from time to time. And I yeah. think we're all trying to do the same thing. So let's put the soup together. Yeah. And you're about to have the second season too, right? Where you're actually going to have guests and interviews and things like that. So is that kind of the direction that you're sort of heading it? It's becoming more of like a platform, industry platform rather than just like you guys or what's the sort of the vision of where the podcast goes eventually or kind of what it turns into? I think you just pretty much nailed that. that like the answer is in the question. I feel like you oh, okay, did great. it better than I could have done. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I think that if it was just three, three directors sitting around having a chat, we could do that in isolation. But I think the reason that you take it online and you put it into a podcast is because you want to share with people. And so that that was always the purpose of this thing. It wasn't sort of super roughed out, but basically we just said we would really love to share some of the things that have happened to us in the you know decade or so of, of starting our practices that someone might be able to pick up on a lot earlier than we did so we can push things forward for someone else, help someone else in the same way that you know like parents are always trying to pass on information to their kids it's like yeah. there's a whole generation of emerging practices out there and, and things are tough like I, I mean I know there's a building there's a housing boom going on at the moment but certainly in Perth it's been dire for a long time and we were like how is how is anyone without sort of owning property and going through the mining boom and having a heap of equity behind them how is anyone going to start or run a practice and yeah. so it's 
It's the conflict you have with a client that it takes you five hours to write that email. It's the it's it's all these little tiny things, not quite knowing what's what feet are right, or just being unsure about things in general that wastes so much of our time as small practice directors or emerging um, emerging practices. Yeah. As a collective of architects, you think there's a there's like a broader benefit that you're better off when other architects are doing well as well. Yeah, and that's the that's written into the DNA of our profession. I mean, we have yeah. um, member organisations, and if you you can chat to other professionals about you know, and they'll be like, we don't have this kind of club thing that you guys have going on. And I actually do think that that is a very sort of you, not unique to architecture, but it's 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 not found in a lot of professions. This kind of guild thing that we have. And so I think it's sort of, it, it gets taught to you. And so when I did my registration, I was taught by a guy called Paul Rosen and he actually runs these little registration sessions at his firm for like orphans, I guess, people who, who, who can't or don't have a mentor or don't have this person that can help them through the reg. And I was like, what, you know, why do you do it? And he's like, I've, oh, because it's essential to give back. I mean, this is how this I've chosen. This is my way of doing it. This is how I give back. And so that that is just, I think you really can only survive in architecture by having a little bit of that in you. And that's what the podcast is. Everyone has different things that they're passionate about as well, yeah. whether it's like, don't, you know, don't they belong to a community club or they're planting trees or they're doing, you know, yeah donating their time in some way for other issues that are not architect related. It just happens to be that I see architecture or the architectural profession as the solution to a lot of things. And so I'm always geared towards that. And so our sort of the, or the thing that, that I like domain, donating my time to is, is seeing other, other small practice directors rise up, you know, and, and, and sort of, dominate also and then there's like a, a gender equity thing to that yep. so you know maybe there's some girls out there that could that would this will really help because I'd really like to see that number at 50 percent I mean that's always driving yep. the thought process behind a lot of things we do and then also another part of that is just that I would like to see a lot more architecture out there I'm sick of seeing like utter crap filling the suburbs I understand and like trying to deep dive into the economics of all of that stuff as a real lay person and, and doing developments and trying to understand those things, you know, so we can be part of that debate. I may not have the answers, but just to learn enough to be part of the debate is is really important. That was that was like such a cool answer because I think like I, I, I also get this this kind of in the in the sort of the marketing and the branding and communication space, there's always this question that architects and directors have, which is like, how do I define my mission or define my purpose? It's seen as this like business planning exercise, right? And like, mm. you're, you're so familiar with it, but like, I don't know if this is to the listeners, but like what Kate, you're talking about, like that's an example of somebody who is actually kind of living and breathing like purposes and missions, whether you would call them that or not. But it's like, I, I give a shit about these things and I'm actively doing stuff about them. Is it as simple as that? Like, do you see there being a difference between that mission and purpose stuff that we like read about in the branding books and then kind of how you're approaching it. So it is very clear when I, you know, just describe what we're passionate about. And I think that that's, that's good. I think the only thing that's ever resonated with me was I did a purpose test or like mm. it was an online thing. One of my friends in social enterprise sent me and was like, you should do this because it really helped you work out yeah. who you are as a person. And basically my, you, are, you answer all these questions about whether you like helping large amounts of people or small amounts of people or do you want to be at the start of change or at the end of change? Do you, you know, do all these different sort of psychological cues. And my thing came out at the end, it basically said, you want to be a catalyst. And so oh. I know this about myself that I'm not happy unless I'm catalyzing things. And also I, I, I'm desperate to share knowledge as well. And so that's part of the thing. If I run into a middle-aged man who just, you know, doesn't want to like does not want to receive that knowledge from me because I'm not what he sees as knowledgeable yeah. it's just like you know it's a massive explosion it's nuclear yeah, and so yeah. I know I have to stay away from that type yeah. of person and so I wish that thing was still online I tried to look I tried to send it to people over time they've taken it down just maybe oh, they've made it behind we the might need to build a new paper. one like that yeah <laughs> Commission it was a just catalyze a study of some sort and develop it was some new models so but illuminating such a good and my exercise. friends who my friends who did that as well, theirs was dead on, you know, one was a builder. He likes to build systems that change things. And the other one was an engager. So she likes to, you know, put people together and that's how she likes to that's change so, things. That's so helpful. I remember even listening to the podcast 
when the, when the topic of differentiation or like point of difference came up, you were like, Mick, I know yours. You're this, you're like the coolest architect in Ballarat and Warwick, yours is bloody obvious too. Like <laughs> you guys just have such obvious and you're like, I still don't know what mine is though. But like, so there's this, there is this thing, right? You can't see what you look like from the outside. Oh, it's quite hard to do that. And so this was an exercise for you where you were like, this test actually helps it. It says this back to me and I can kind of try it on for size and go, oh, is that, does that, does that ring true? Does that feel right? And then once you saw it, you were like, ah, oh, it all makes sense now. And that's my direction. Is that kind of the feeling that you got from that when you were a catalyst? Yeah. And also it's, it's one of the, just knowing why you've had such bad experiences in your life before, Yeah, it, you know, like why was I so unhappy at that time? Like, what was it about that person or that situation or whatever that just, you know, made me feel terrible to the point where I had to get out, you know? And so how can you avoid being in those situations a little bit faster is just knowing yourself. And that particular test was just so good because it was talking about, you know, the way you want to make change or your purpose, not like, oh, I might be, you know, a gung-ho bullet a gate type personality i know all of that about myself as well and that's that's really good and i try to balance those yeah. parts of my personality with other things but this was more like the way i'm going to approach life in general it was pretty hilarious but when i did a pro, what is it the, the business subject at, at you know in graduate in the master's professional of practice or whatever that yeah that thing i failed <laughs> it ironically i scraped through <laughs> Great through. Like, hey, but I had a hilarious run at architecture yeah, practice. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I was like, look, I don't reckon I need to do any of this SWAT stuff. I just yeah, need yeah, to be, yeah. you know, sure. my idea of running a business is a little bit different to the old, yep, you know, yep, art yep. practice units. Anyway, so we did this hilarious video, which you know, we had we made this fake firm called Les Vistaches, and it was all about <laughs> sleaze. And, you know, like our office was on a yacht and we were basically just trying to, you know, build mansions made out of diamonds, which, yeah, yeah, is, is actually like amongst all of our friends. Occasionally we, you know, get together and grab the video out again and watch it from, you know, <laughs> 10 years ago or something because it's hilarious. But Les Moustache was uh, actually the like cleverly designed front man. So we, it, and it was oh. the whole practice was girls behind the scenes using these guys to get what they wanted yeah. and you know sort of had this whole power play thing in it and basically you know it's so funny but I saw my friend and she was like you are Les you know oh. <laughs> that's who you are you are a cleverly designed front man <laughs> you've ended up becoming a cleverly designed front man Les yeah a man unbelievable designed by the women to be the man that men dream of in the same way that you have a band like the bass guitarist is no less important than the lead singer the drummer is you know I my partner loves Kings of Leon you know and if yeah. you took any one of the Kings of Leon out it would be crap yeah. so you know I think that's kind of what Whispering Smith is everyone I've always what tried to work towards me not being the you know because there's this whole like soul genius thing with architecture which I think is really stupid because no person can deliver anything by themselves like you just can't you can't do the marketing run the business do all the work be the genius you know it requires a team and so I guess that's that's what Whispering Smith is. I'm just the identifiable, cleverly designed frontman, but you know, the yeah. real engine of it is 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 the team. Yeah. And everyone that we work with, all our consultants and our clients and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, even there was yeah. a profile in AR recently where they, yeah. you know, we desperately wanted to get a picture of the team on the they front cover. You. No, no, they were like, they were fine with it. I just couldn't get it organized. And in the end, as a <laughs> as a as a group of extremely busy <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Young women, we were like, yeah. Kate, it's easy just to shoot you. Just yeah. put a photo in and, and get yeah, it yeah. done, you know? Get out there, And Les. I was like, all right, yeah, okay, I got it. Okay, it's me. And so that, you know, that, like we make all these decisions together as a team, which yeah, is, wow. it's, you know, and everyone has their unique personality that they bring bring to the table. And I so we, and we're constantly stressing out about being cast as the sole genius because I think really? that, that is, yeah, always like terrified of it. I always use the word we. Even when I was just me in the early days, I was yeah. like, I'll eventually build this thing that other people will want to be a part of because I never, ever want to just be Kate Fitzgerald architects. It's yeah. Whatever, you know, how boring. Yeah, that's that interesting. Because, be? I mean, you mentioned there there is this kind of, this sort of, oh, the hero architect thing. But, you know, I speak to a lot of architects and I'd say like 95 out of 100 times, they say exactly what you just said to me. Mm. <laughs> so like... 
it's despite our best intentions we end up the hero <laughs> architect so why do we kind of why do we end up getting like crammed into this idea that you know and ar the architecture firm does need that that front that front person right the cleverly designed front man like the, why do you need the why do you need the cleverly designed front man like despite what you're trying to do that ends up happening anyway yeah, totally. look, I, totally look it's just a skill set alternative. Like, you know, someone has over time developed the ability to speak publicly. I guess that's my skill set. There's, there's, you know, the strengths and weaknesses to everybody. And I guess the front man become, is just the person who has that ability to do what, that particular what, job. Could you sort of summarize what you think some of those skills are? So like you mentioned speaking, but like what are, what are some of the other skills that you think make you like the good front man? Look, there's another thing that came from my time in social enterprise was that there are these four animals and they represent a personality type. Yeah. So you've got a bear, that person is really considered and makes decisions slowly. You've got a deer, who's a person who's always worried about, you know, or, you know, making sure the team is okay. And you've got the, the buffaloes who just like get shit done and often they can, you know, bulldoze people out of the way in the attempt to achieve the task. And then you've got the eagle, which is the visionary, the person who's like floating above being like, oh, what about this? And what about this? I'm, you know, and I am a, I'm a raging buffalo. Yeah, and I got to watch it. <laughs> But also I feel like I have quite a bit of when I have, when there's not tasks to be done and I get a bit of time to think about things, I'm a real eagle. I slip into this other thing where I'm always thinking about larger problems and, you know, that, that's kind of, that's kind of probably the thing that, that, that guiding light or that other person has. Mm. There's always talk about great teams in that way. You know, I feel like the Beatles probably had, you know, Paul McCartney and DCM have, you know, all had different roles as well and did different things. So, yeah, I, yeah, I think every great team has has a person who has that particular vision or maybe yeah. they all have elements of that vision. Yeah, well, interestingly, since you're a single, like, director, you don't have, an, like, you're not DCM, right? There isn't, there isn't others that are sort of, you, and you sort of mentioned that you are kind of sometimes the buffalo and sometimes the eagle. Does that sort of when that switch happens are you sort of surprised by it or is it something that you kind of expect at certain times like where you go from just this kind of smashing through stuff being a buffalo just like <laughs> i'm not really thinking i'm moving forward or I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm i'm moving get the hell out of my way to i'm just gonna like take in that 30 like the eagle the thirty thousand foot view i'm gonna like take that big step backwards and become like very fine-tuned and pay attention to everything like so mm. is that like, yeah. does that have to do with kind of, I would assume times of busyness and times of quiet would be my guess, but is there any sort of, is there anything else that sort of triggers that switch for you or is it something conscious or? I think I'm buffalo-y even in my eagleness. Which oh, is really? <laughs> yeah. So You're like even. a buffalo who thinks he's an eagle sometimes. <laughs> I know, sometimes. So like there, there was a moment when I was doing it, I was trying to get to house A and B and, and, and C through the council. It was a nightmare. They weren't, you know, they were like, basically I was sitting down, you know, had this meeting and they were like, essentially, if you want to do something sustainable, that's up to you. And I was like, but there's a banner behind you that says the word sustainable. Like, <laughs> is that not what you're, like, you should take that down. If you're not going to support sustainable design and help pretty much the only project in your entire books right now get through, then you're not actually complying with that at all. And they were yeah. like, listen, if you want to do it, it's up to you because yeah. that is the planning system. And I was like, you know what, man, I'm going <laughs> to fucking change that. <laughs> And I'm going to come back <laughs> Yeah. and I'm going to say in your face, like, you know, yeah. and so even recently the medium density policy that we've been really heavily involved in, in the, in the drafting and the helping guide it from an yeah. architecture slash developer who's delivered a, a grouped dwelling medium density project that kept trees and, you know, had all the outcomes that they were after, you know, we did do that. And then we have just done a massive piece of advocacy at the ACA. We had a like symposium that had almost, you know, it was like 270 people out, including heaps of parliamentary and, you know, every single industry from the landscape to the planning institute to the, you know, to the property developers, everyone was there. And we've like, you know, made a series of videos that actually talk about this, this policy and how it's going to impact yeah. our entire state. This is the thing I said I would do five years ago and it's here now. And like, let's just, let's just rip it to shreds. Let's do whatever we can to change yeah. it and deliver yeah. on that promise to that asshole at the council that day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were kind of talking a little bit 
in one of the episodes about how some of your earlier projects, the ones that you guys have gotten kind of a fair bit of recognition for were projects that you had done for, you know, friends or family or people that you knew where it gave you this, what, what sound like a lot of autonomy and freedom and appreciation and meaningfulness and all this kind of stuff. And you sort of, you sort of distinguish that from some of your earlier client projects where you didn't feel yeah. you had that latitude to, to be as creative in those projects. I'm just so curious to know more about how you sort of think about that idea of like maintaining that integrity, working with friends and family and some of those kind of complex issues. I feel like maybe it's got a little bit to do with the fact that I think it's Leon Van Schaik once sort of writes about this idea that, you know, we went from being a master builder at some point and then we aligned ourselves in the with the professions. So we were like, mm -hmm. at the time when engineering was really cool. Yeah. And so we were like, oh, we want to be like that. And so we became a profession that advises essentially in the same way that engineers sort of do that when then the you know that that became separate from the building thing and then it we've sort of seen our industry become consultants we're like we're you know we used to be the head of it and and now we're not we're not the head decision maker and it, it, you would feel that pressure as a as a practitioner when you're trying to design something awesome and you're you've just you're trying to deliver at the same time there's always that thing where you're trying to deliver what your client wants but a lot of the time and i would you would know this if you've designed your own house as the client you can go way ott with what you think is necessary in a house and completely mess it up like there's heaps of things about house a and b that yeah. i'm like why did i do that you know because yeah. as the client i was even my mind was and i know that these things are traps but i was driven by resale i was driven by all kinds of weird things like, you know, the pressure of not being able to fight too hard at council. Like I had to roll over on a couple of things that I probably should have fought for, you know, that sort of affected the planning. And so, you know, and then, and then there's this like painful idea of clients choosing every tile, you know, every tap and being involved in every decision. And, I mean, and that's what they're paying for. That's the service. That is what we've been, that is what we are. We are like the choice consultants. Would you like platinum or would you like brushed nickel? Like it's, <laughs> It's, it's essentially what the whole, what, what it's a fee for service thing and they get whatever they want out of you. And yeah. so this idea that, that that's our profession is that to everybody else, but we to ourselves are still the designers at university. They're still doing, you know, studio for the majority of the course where you yeah. think that you're the person in the driver's seat. And then you've got to try and reconcile that with, with the fact that you're actually, you know, being treated like a glove like a design glove that someone else is yeah. putting on and using you to make their own building with. Um, <laughs> that was a gross image for some reason. It's <laughs> really gross. I've been trying to work on another one. But that's all I've got. <laughs> that's, um, that's, that's, your, that's the one you prepared earlier. <laughs> I just keep, okay, every time that comes Is up, that I'm the like, talk oh, you give something. each new client? Now, we have to talk about the design glove. <laughs> yeah, like, I won't be the glove. <laughs> I'm not going to be the glove, but I will be the eagle. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so, I mean, and then the best thing you can do is try and build that team, right? Where you go, all right, you yeah. guys are the eagle, but we're the buffaloes and we'll deliver it. But you have to accept that, you know, like all eagles that you've, you know, you just keep looking off into the future. You don't fly down a land on my back and peck away at every <laughs> single thing I'm doing. God damn it. So the idea of, you know, why Whispering Smith's, you know, best projects, actually pretty much the only projects that we've published are ones that we have had no client for yeah. because our clients, we just cannot communicate this to them without sounding like real dickheads. Yeah. And so that, yeah. And so like, and often like the clients that we've had in the past, and one of the reasons why we're going with this legend thing in trying to find these other people who want to collaborate with us or, you know, commission us is because there were so many people who just wanted to use us Oh, I like your work, but I want to do my work, but with you doing it. Yeah. And we realized, you know, really early on now in concept phase, usually they don't get through to us. <laughs> Occasionally they get through to the keeper and we go, whoa, 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 you know, that's not the right thing for us. We prefer to just work on, you know, my mum's house in Ballarat. But like in terms of you talking about that and this idea of like, you know, you've looked at this situation and gone, you know, I just, I just don't like the role that I have to play for a lot of these clients in the way that architects are perceived. And so, you know, fuck it, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do something else. So I'm going to avoid that to, to uh, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to 
pushed back on that. Some architects would listen to that and be like, oh, well then, you know, their projects don't count because they were able to make all the decisions. They didn't have to deal with the hassle of a real client. Whereas you're challenging that and going like, no, it's not about how hard the client makes you work. That's not what makes a building great, right? That's right. I mean, it, it, yeah, if you can produce a terrific building with all that emotional baggage, then good yeah. for you. But why would you want to live your life like that? That yeah. sucks. You so, know, and so it's ironic at the moment, but we have we have the best clients we've ever had. Yeah. And they are like fully letting us do our thing. And we have this incredible time where we're designing their, their houses that 10 times better than anything we've ever done in half the time. Yeah. You know, because we've got it right. They yeah. are. They are talking our language. They understand that we're not a consultant who works for them. They yeah. understand that they've commissioned us to deliver this thing, this vision for them, and they just want to live in the thing that we've created. Yeah. And that is just so rare. I don't want to produce that other type of work. We actually worked it. We're working on it for four years. We won't shoot it. Yeah. Like we've thought about it and I just don't want to shoot it. And usually when we shoot a project, like we get Ben Hosking over, who's a really good mate of mine yeah, for yeah, many yeah. years. You know, we have Melbourne cans and we sit around and we just like, yeah. we take our time and we really love that process. And I just, the thought of shooting this project that is so severely compromised with clients who I think just didn't give a shit about Whispering Smith at all. You know, I don't want to celebrate that. I'd rather just let that one go by the wayside and we'll focus totally. on these other kick-ass ones we've got coming out. And so there might be a bit of a gap in our portfolio, but whatever. <laughs> <You'll make> it <laughs> we'll fill it with more stuff we've done ourselves. Yeah, but you're, but you're playing the long game. Like it, it wouldn't make sense for you to put out that compromised project, right? It's about that emotion. It's not just, it's not just the, the building itself. It just hurts. Yeah. It doesn't feel good. And yeah. so I, if I wrote the story about it, you know, so the story I would like, write I about. I'm not happy. Yeah, I'm not. I don't love this project anymore. <laughs> like I, I had a horrible time. You know, yeah. our lives were almost ruined. That like, would be the it, story. You'd be like, this, uh, <laughs> we this would want to read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell <laughs> you a, a like, horror story. <laughs> <laughs> but my mum's house. So my yeah. mum, you know, bought, like w bought this beautiful old 1880s residence in Ballarat, you know, and she she's turned it into a home for, you know, me and my two brothers when, we were, sorry, my dad is involved in this as well, but he's kind of yeah. like architecture dyslexia a little bit. So my, and my yeah. mum is very like, you know, she's she got me into architecture in the first place. She's very design oriented. Yeah. And so we lived in this house in Ballarat when I was going to school in, when I went to the, like the late years of my high school and my two brothers were there. And it's sort of, everyone's kind of moved on. My mum is now running our farm and so that th this house is just it's time for it to have an, its new owner but she always wanted to do this renovation to it yeah. she's been waiting for like five <laughs> years for whispering yeah. smith to have enough time to do it my partner yeah. maddie is over there right now finishing it off because he's yeah. whispering smith's secret weapon he does oh, all of our detailing and i can't wait to write a story about that you yeah. know like my mum is my client you know she's yeah. my feminist hero yeah the house is phenomenal we gave it a new life we did all the things to it that should have been done we fixed the cracks we fixed the rising damp we fixed all the things you can't see yeah. to give it another 200 years worth of life and that phenomenal story I don't give a shit if that you know my mom paid me in hugs yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah and that was worth it <laughs> so so does that in the future do do you 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 basically you do you have had some projects where you're like okay these were these were pretty regrettable in terms of taking these on these weren't great so obviously you're not going to repeat that mistake again with with them so you've developed a much stricter criteria and you've just gone no like i'm not going to do this stupid compromise shit i'm going to be very strict about the clients i work with Le it's uh, not just about the work it's about the emotion as well yeah the i don't emotion, want the me journey. My, yeah my yeah. mental health my team our emotional well-being we're just not going to be put through the ringer yeah. so so you've kind of developed this real sort of tight criteria around what you're looking for in a great client it it's not necessarily like spelled out right in terms of very specific things you i think the comment you had in the podcast was like you know a legend when you see one right so it's mm. and that's something that i find you know it's an interesting challenge that comes up with my clients quite a bit as well where they where they are thinking about you know how do we filter for better quality clients when we get these inquiries in what's our process how do we scale it <laughs> right particularly particularly firms that i assume their marketing is going well they're getting more inquiries and you obviously don't want to be spending you know sitting down for these long you know two hour 
briefing meetings with clients when you're busy as shit. So mm. what's your what's your approach to figuring out who you should and shouldn't be working with and just it's a it's a bit mean, but at, in the early days, it's a bit of a triage system. Like we've had yeah. like forty inquiries. No, tell me about it. Know. I love triage systems. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm, yeah. That's well, what I'm we have for. to. Yeah, like we've had yeah more than forty inquiries in the last six months. Yeah. It, it just is phenomenal. Part of the process is making sure that whenever we get an inquiry, that everybody leaves with some information that helps them yeah. on their way. That we don't yeah. just say no, you're out. We, you know, either send them to other grads or other small emerging practices that we think might be more suitable to their budget than us, yeah. especially if they're legends, you know, you don't want to waste one of them. And yeah. so that's that's one part of it. Also people who have no money at all and think that they can hire an architect, we sort of tell them price mm. per square meter of, you know, yeah. sort of architect, building designers, and then suggest sort of a pathway forward for them. So like the initial, the, you get the initial inquiry and so an email or a phone call or a form submission or whatever, are you, do you, do you straight away kind of like that information tells me this isn't going to work and you're just quick, you know, how do you keep this to a, to a, efficient... no, we send. Yeah. Okay. So we always send out, and this is this Nikita's d- domain. She's the yeah. like person who manages the info at Whispering Smith yeah. um, inbox. Yeah. She will send a like pretty, not a, you know, it's not a canvas. It's a basic canned response, but we have yeah, like different yeah. parts of it that we fill out ourselves yeah. and it basically asking them for their brief. So what sort of, what are they looking yeah. for? Renovation, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, whatever, what's the scope yeah. or what their budget is. And we just blatantly ask that because do not dance around that question. Like you cannot yeah. do, you're just wasting everyone's time and you'll make them angry yeah. in the end. If you suddenly work out after like five meetings and two emails that they've only got 50 grand, you know, like just, <laughs> yeah get it out there it's yeah. you know in the same way that when you go on realestate.com the house has a price next to it most of the yeah. time yeah. you know like yeah. it's just get it out there don't be afraid yeah. of it so that's what we do and then usually we get a response to that and we also very importantly ask them what work they like so if someone was like man i love addition office perfect i love space agency i yeah. love you know I like, like whatever nice. yeah then then you're like awesome we are good. gonna cool that's gonna click well then We're we love the all those page. architects as yeah. well yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Awesome. And so you find that that's really helpful in terms of even in that not quite canned process, but it's like systematized. You sort of systematized. It's if systematized. we just basically ask them what kind of architecture they like, or is that what you kind of do? Is that the kind of the question you ask? Like brief budget and what kind of projects they like. What kind and of projects then they like. From that point onwards, you can usually work out whether the, you need to send them to someone else at that point yeah. or whether yeah. they're someone that we should speak to on the phone. And I think also like, it takes the emotion out of it because a lot of the time you get these, you know, really heartfelt emails from people who yeah. sound incredible. And of course we're drawn to them because they're like, Oh my God, Whispering Smith have followed you for years. Yeah. You're so yeah, amazing. Yeah. We just really fans. want you to do yeah, this yeah, project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got a hundred grand and you're like, yeah. Oh God, you yeah, know, this yeah. is really sad, but we just want to help them. So, <laughs> yeah. and we can't, we can't. Yeah. And we've yeah. tried many times and we've really messed it up. So there's, you know, there's just, there's, I'm sure someone will come up with a way of helping those people, but at the moment, our system, just can send I, it to a graduate. <laughs> yeah, so can I really quickly touch on that, the smaller budget stuff? Because I do remember, I might have dreamt this, but I feel like yonks ago, your website had this like big small, help. Small, medium, medium, and large. Help. Yeah, right. And that always stuck out to me. I was like, okay, we've got small help, medium help, and large help. And I'm like, that's really cool. And I, I kind of like that, but obviously it's not there anymore. So that... That's something that you've moved on from. Did you find that there was just some real challenges in terms of trying to create that options at different budget ranges? Yeah, or? I think actually it's about the type of architects that we are. So maybe we started to do some of that identity type stuff. Yeah. And we worked out that, you know, the kind of things that we, that the work that they're seeing and loving is us doing a start to finish full service where yeah. we manage the hell out of the build. You That's know? what we're best at. Yeah. We're going to ask a thousand RFIs, you know, because we, yeah. we're, or we're really heavily involved and we push into furniture and, you know, yeah. everything is really sort of detailed. There are architects who would do a five grand concept design way better than us. And so, you know, I think it's about knowing what you can provide, what your what service you can provide. So and you ultimately think, decided to just sort of pick your battles, right? And just go like, that's, yeah. our, that's our thing. That's going to be our yeah. thing. Yeah, that's right. And we, we will try and help those people in another way by not yeah. by not providing them a 
extensive custom one-on-one design glove service. Yeah, we'll actually yeah. just produce a product for them and they can either buy it or not buy it. And at the end of it, you know, usually like people are like, oh, I want a house exactly like house B or I want a house exactly like, like house well, here, A. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so quite often that if you feel like, if you feel like an inquiry is like not a good fit based on budget or taste or whatever, you might, you might send them off to another, somebody else, another architect graduate, that sort of thing. But now you've also got new resident as a kind of a way to not upsell, downsell, maybe a cross sell, cross sell somebody cross this idea sell. of cross yeah. sell. We've got something that's like different, but we stand behind, behind it, the same level of quality. Like we would live in this, you know, just as much as we'd live in one of our like full custom design houses. So do you want to talk a little bit about new resident? I absolutely love it because I'm obsessed with the website. I love the design, the branding, the copywriting, the purpose, all that stuff, the positioning I'm obsessed, but do you want to talk about the architecture side? <laughs> like sure. what, what that is and kind of what new resident offers. Well, we should also thank those other legends who we work with at Nude Studio for putting um, all of our branding and oh, you know, nice. that, that, that sass in the wording that we just yeah. cannot nail because we yeah, end up yeah. being bitter good, about architecture. Good sass. It's good great sass. sass. That's great um, sass. John Dury. Yeah, who's nice. the, he- the head of Design Studio and who's just been a phenomenal person awesome. to work with. The whole team at Nude. Sonia, etc. And so, there for, for new, yeah, you know, have to honestly. If anyone's yeah. launching a, you know, <laughs> off, off the shelf design service anytime soon, off the rack, yeah. then give if them a call. If you need good branding, go to those guys. <laughs> they amazing. Yeah, and so the website is phenomenal, and we realised that there was a the whole. So Whispering Smith as a brand is something we intimately know really well, and it's easy to do. It's just you know, it's just yeah. us doing us simple. Yeah. Every time we put something out, I know whether or not it's Smith, you know, yeah. but new, this one new, you know, really helped us build this other thing. And they were like, it's not architecture. You can't do architect stuff. You got to get out of that mindset. It's, it's yeah. something else. And on the podcast, I think you might've heard Mick Maloney talk about this one client that he had where they, they were on this project for ages. They it was a real battle. They, you know, got it through in the end. Um, it was a phenomenal house, really re- ready to go. I think they were like at tender stage, like right mm. down the end, ready to get a building license. And their clients called him up and were like, oh, my God, Mick, we're so excited. Th- look, this is incredible news, but, and it, you know, might come as a bit of a shock, but we actually just bought a house. We mm. fell in love with it, walked past it. It was going for auction and we just bought it or whatever. And we don't need the house anymore. Yeah that you've agonizingly and painstakingly delivered on us for like two years. Yeah. And he was just like, what the fuck? Like, (laughs) you know, and that, that, that little anecdote summarizes what new resident is all about. The average person who really loves design, reads magazines, is on Instagram, et cetera, very design educated, will walk in and buy a house that is like 40% what they want. Yeah. And drop all that money on it, like drop yeah. 800, 900 grand on this thing and yeah. go, oh, well, you know, it's, there's an expectation that when you buy a house, parts of it won't be right for you. Yeah. But there is an expectation when you're doing a custom design service that, you know, you'll control every single decision sometimes. Yeah. And, and, and that doesn't necessarily lead to a better outcome as we've just covered. So the idea that you can do your work as a practice and then put it forward and go, here's what it is. Here's what it looks like. We don't just have one client here to please. Yeah. We've actually got a room of like 60 people or whatever it is who would all want to buy Whispering Smiths, who all yeah. engage in Whispering Smiths design yeah. ethos. Who wants it? Yeah. So, or so if you don't want it, we'll sell it to the open market for, you for know, sure. because someone will buy it. So you're, no so you're basically, so sort of explain it like I'm five. You're kind of like, you're acting as a developer, essentially. Is that the idea that you're sort of picking a, like talk, talk to me about the kind of the mechanics of how you Ooh. end up sort of getting a project and what your role is in okay. sort of from sort of beginning to end, I guess, just a bit of a okay. summary. So the average developer in WA, in, in, the, in the middle ring, so this medium density, yeah. this is like townhousey type stuff. So you're taking a block. <laughs> let's yeah. say 850s or 900 square meters or something and you, you've got an old house on it, a couple of old trees, you know, and the, ha- the house is tired. It's someone, so a developer is going to come in and buy that block and just bulldoze the lot. That's pretty yeah. much how it works over here in WA. Clean yeah. slate, subdivide, sell off the land, you know, buy a Monaro, whatever. And so we are basically canvassing the suburbs for a certain, there's a certain economic 
equation that we're looking for, but we're also looking for an existing house with character like house yeah. B was. We're also looking for existing trees to be on that site. Again, yeah. that's what house A and B had. And we want to save those things and then build a micro community around that. And that is vastly different to the cut and build new crap dwellings approach because we're finding that so many young people just want to buy an existing house. Yeah. I mean, the whole like first home buyers grant and everything is trying to shove them into, into the, into buying new ones. Yeah. But literally, you know, to put your hand up if you know a person who would love to buy, who walks past old cute houses and goes, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> something yeah. about, about yeah. that is what grabs people. And so we're centering our model around trying to save those. Yeah. And also delivering on canopy targets and things like that that yeah. other developers aren't doing. Yeah. So it's sort of an ethical element to it as well. Sure. So on board with everything, but you lost me at micro community. <laughs> Okay, so in so in, in, the, in the medium density ring, we're basically yeah. saying lots of people are going and buying a block that might be four hundred square meters. This yeah. sort of end up being about somewhere in between three and four hundred square meters. Yeah. Now you can average it out across like eleven suburbs, I think that we've done it over. Yeah. And pretty much the average price of land, it the block ends up being about four hundred grand. Okay. Because that is the amount of, so, and they're all median house prices, like say 850 to a million dollars or like say probably 750 to a million dollars. And basically that means if you take an average block anywhere in that ring, anywhere in that price bracket, Mm -hmm. and then you add a shitty project home to it, you will end up with a median house price. Yeah. And so the minute that you try and deliver an architecturally designed house, Mm -hmm with all of that custom service and years worth of work and you sitting down and doing schedules and having meetings and producing concepts and whatever, yeah. you add that, you add the build and then you add your fee to the top and you have overcapitalization. Yeah. And so these people who come to us, they might have 450 mm-hmm. and we can't help them. It's a great budget. They can get a really good build at 450. Yeah. And so if we control the subdivision, we control the land size. So we're not overdoing it in the land. We can buy like a block that we split up into slightly smaller, which brings the price down. We don't demolish the existing house. So that brings the price down. And then we build like three or four houses around the old house to make this grouped dwelling development. Yeah. And then we keep the, you know, so the tree of this one might hang over into that one because, hey, that's, you know, how trees work. And so by... And then by sort of collectively designing this thing for, you know, three or four future couples or families or si- or whatever, future yeah. residents, yeah. we're sort of taking on this economy of scale that pays us. Yes. Whereas if we were to design one house for one person on one block, it doesn't work. But yeah. we can deliver yeah. a whole block spread it out to across. a whole bunch of people yeah yeah yeah, yeah. exactly like nightingale it's like nightingale for i was gonna say like how does it sort of it's it's like a different scale to nightingale like it, you're mm-hmm. not building like apartment buildings like towers or not not towers but like you know but that's uh, that, perth yeah exactly that's a suburban oh, place I'm from, I'm it's from a perth, perfect Kate, i get it i get it I know, <laughs> I know, it wouldn't make sense to chuck like the commons in you know mount lawley oh it might actually mount lawley maybe yeah, a bit further mount lawley. Up. dianella right double view gonna, Put yeah double view double exactly view. exactly like, yeah. that's yeah but so so you're kind well, of instantly doing... it fails because there's just not enough train lines so i think yeah. melbourne has like i don't know heaps of train lines that will go off in different directions whereas perth has like two and so you just can't get the nightingale next to the public transport to take yeah. away the cars and it's really tough you know it's not that it isn't ready and that we don't that we can't do that on the train lines but there are awesome suburbs that are required for density that aren't well connected by public transport and that isn't going to happen yeah you know immediately and so there is this infill development model that's required that is sort of respectful of that character and 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 low and streetscape sort of yeah and and do you do you feel that this is sort of a natural business model that has emerged from the fact that you know you have built i'm not going to say like a famous <laughs> like architecture <laughs> practice but you know like in your market in the perth market you guys are definitely like pretty pretty bloody massive and well respected and well known and have Thanks. eighteen thousand instagram we? followers yeah come on nice. you're like national profile like you're, you're definitely not under the radar like let's put it that way now that you're 
doing new resident do you kind of go like mm. oh shit we better even get even better <laughs> we better get our profile even bigger now because now we've got this scope that we could do all these amazing projects and we're going to need more people like a, a lot more people or where is your sort of position on kind of marketing it at the moment i feel yeah. like john john jury who his new studio is like constantly tearing his hair out <laughs> oh really like, blow this thing up kate you know yeah. and other and nikita and claire like you know go go bananas like what are you doing yeah. you should be like she could have a wait list of like eight thousand people and yeah, i'm like yeah, yeah, well, right. of course you make an excellent point, John. And I think there is that, but and it it is like it is going to be is it's economy of scale, right? It's about it's about having enough people, yeah, to service. And so basically, like I mean, if our wait list grows, it's currently growing at like two hundred percent, yeah. You know, on a sort of nine month kind of rolling, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that means that we need to deliver a lot of houses. But the thing is. Yeah we don't actually need any more staff to deliver those houses if we aren't managing the clients. Yeah. And that is kind of the secret. It's like we are capable of delivering so much more architecture. Yeah. Uh, and Mick, Mick's talked about this as well. He's like, I could bloody do a whole doc set, you know, get a DA ready and do a whole doc set in six weeks. Yeah. Like this is the thing about architecture is we're hopelessly inefficient yeah. in the way that we deal with our clients. We haven't quite managed to nail that or maybe it is just in yeah. this is how we're dealing with it we're going okay well whispering smith can only have a certain number of clients per year because we just course, yeah we need to be able to service them in a way that they getting the most out of us that they're enjoying yeah. it and they're having a great time and so that's going to require a lot of communication and a lot of effort from us to be able to deliver that and so we don't have exponential capacity for that yeah and then the answer do. isn't just keep on hiring people again and again and again and end up being like 18 people, right? It's not the solution. It's not the solution for us. We don't want to be big. Yeah. And that was even a really interesting realization that we don't want more jobs. We actually want better jobs and better yeah. jobs doesn't mean higher paying jobs. It means better clients. And so yeah. we've focused on that. And I think we're going pretty well with that because our clients yeah. alone are absolute legends, which is terrific. Yeah. And then the other side of it is like, how can you, if you're not going to go out there and chase work and do all this stuff, uh, and we're going to be really selective with the kind of projects that we take on, then where is all our other revenue going to come from? And we're like, okay, well, we can design houses really easily and yep. we, I know how to do developments. And so let's just put those two things together and create this other arm of our business that is about still do doing the thing we love doing, which is delivering awesome projects, but we'll just take out the time consuming factor of having a custom service with our clients. And then our clients also are getting our architecture for drastically less. Yeah. Kind of a win-win So it's situation. like very win-win. Hopefully. Are there, any, are there any downsides? The downsides are that property development is very hard. And yeah. I think you need to come from a background of yeah. enormous wealth <laughs> yeah. in order to do it really quickly and really successfully. And I mean, Jeremy kind of really flipped that on its head by building a fund and getting all his friends involved in it and doing all of that kind of thing that he he did. And that was... You know, that's that's a phenomenal scope of work that is so far outside this, the realm of being an architect. Yeah. And to sort of be dabbling in that world is is a really, you know, is a real learning curve. Yeah. And so we're, you know, we're sort of like reaching out into this new sector and trying to partner with people and trying to work through even contracts. Like we need a lawyer to write us yeah, a whole bunch yeah, of contracts. Yeah. It's like but like really this is the innovation. This challenging. is why, yeah. this is why it, it, rewards you when you do all the hard work because you're actually inventing something that didn't already exist like nightingale is a great example of that as well because like the the thing that always struck me about that project is like this contract didn't exist this type of loan didn't exist this didn't exist we had to make all this stuff like there were there, yeah. there the reasons that projects like this didn't exist before wasn't because nobody had drawn that type of building <laughs> like that wasn't the issue it was like oh, yeah it was like or like had found the right site like it wasn't the, those weren't the problems the problems were more like all that other logistics there was a lot of logistics to it They're business that, problems yeah essentially. a lot of business problems yeah, yeah and so i mean this is another sort of back to that lewis sort of maybe looping back to the yeah. start about being a catalyst and it's like you know, I've been catalyzed by those types of projects and those yeah. types of practice practitioners. You know, I've looked at people in the past and in who've been in my sort of orbit and said, God, man, that, whatever that person is doing looks like it's the best. And, and 
you know, trying to then sort of definitely feel and breathe the things that are wrong with what we're doing as the architects and go, how can we fix those things is what's sort of leading to that innovation, I think. Mm, mm. And I think that learning those business skills is we're, we're always taught in architecture that, you know, you get a consultant for everything. <laughs> yeah. And I think, okay, well, that's hey, fine. I'm a marketing consultant. So can we just say with the exception, <laughs> with the exception of what Dave does, you don't need. Exception yeah, of, <laughs> of marketing, of course. <laughs> <laughs> which is our almost one and only spend as an, as, a, as an architecture practice. Yeah. And so like, you know, your engineers, your building surveyors, everyone tells you whether or not you're doing the right thing. And you definitely need to hire lawyers and accountants and, and all of these people. But at the same time, you've got to eagle that thing. You've got to yeah. try and you've got this grumpy lawyer. He's like, oh, right, well, this isn't how this sort of works. And you're like, yeah, but why not? And, and, and what if we did this? And, yeah. and can we find a way to sort of take this thing from over here and plug it in to make this work. And that's obviously what Jeremy did for years to get that thing off the ground. Yeah. And then ultimately. Sorry, the entire then, Nightingale team. Again, he's not a sole genius. There is a massive yeah, team no, behind him and exactly. they all did it together. See, we, can't, we can't help ourselves. We know they're all yeah, geniuses over ourselves. there, but like we, we can't help ourselves. We just need one person to refer to. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. That's an, that's an unsettled issue in our in the industry. I, I think. I think you kind of go against the grain a little bit because I just feel like all the talk is like, we need to be more about the client, less about the what the architect wants to do. Like, where, oh, like, how do we deal with this? Yeah, how do we settle this issue? It's not, you it's know. It's so funny. It's so funny because I talk about how much I love our clients and then I'm saying I don't want to work with any of them, you know, which isn't necessarily the case. It's interesting because if we hire someone to do something, all right, so we hired, let, Nude Studio is a really good example. Yeah. You know, to the point where John needs to write everything because I would write something and give it to him and be like, nah, (laughs) you sound like a bitter asshole again, you know? And I'm like, oh, I'm so bitter. (laughs) And he fixes all that and makes it sound better. (laughs) And I just go with him. Like I, I, that, that whole way, I don't know that we've even really contributed that much to the shaping of that website. Occasionally I'll be like, I'll make that picture smaller or this text bigger, but pretty much, you know, we let him do his thing. And so I guess I'm only asking that we work with people who recognise that, that yeah. we recognise in other people. Yeah. I don't tell my accountant how to do my tax return. I wouldn't tell these lawyers that we're hopefully going to get on board how to do their job. And so, you know, yes, the architect is, it is a service. And one of my friends, Beth George, she was like, mm. we had an issue with a client who was like, oh, we want to, we want to, closely collaborate with you to the point where we want to come and sit in the studio and work with you while you design like as and I was like whoa 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 that's the hand glove thing (laughs) yeah that's really got out of control because then I if I do something like do my job and get it done and and go through the process I might get two steps ahead of where you are and there'll be a nuclear explosion that's about control the client is trying to control that and they use the word collaboration a lot when they're doing that. Yep. And actually, it's a commission. Yep. You have commissioned someone. You've commissioned an artist. You've commissioned someone to help you with your marketing. Dave. Yep. Commissioned a graphic designer. You commission a plumber. You commission all these people to come and yep. do their job. And so I guess everyone will draw their line in the sand. I think basically the client that we're looking for is the person who says... I'm not 100% happy with all this stuff, but I trust that you have that vision. You've heard me, you've listened to me and you know what I want. And even though I think that that bit's not 110% what I'm after, I'm happy to move forward. And then you'd be like, okay, well, now that you've expressed a bit of discomfort about this entry or this thing or this whatever else that we've done, let's have a look at it because, you know, we're all a team and it's just that flexibility of them to move with you and understand that it's a process like we've only billed you 20 percent, so of course it's not finished yeah let's move on and let's do the next part of it and yeah yeah, all right we'll work on that bit and sometimes I'm like guys I wasn't sure about this thing and so we've had a look at it and they're like oh yeah that we didn't know what you were up to with that but obviously we just assumed that you had it covered and that is that's it you know that's that's trust and so everyone will have a different measure of how much trust in the relationship they need to yep. be able to get their job done. And I think ours is like right at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, as the commissioner of the work, the client is in the control seat. Yeah. But you would know in any great sort of if you facilitate a meeting or, you know, like any great leader, 
knows that you have to listen and you have to accept yep. that you don't always have the answers and that your team yes. that you have gathered around you are better at other things than you, you know, yep. whether you're the cleverly designed front man and the other guys in your team, are, you require their skill set and you've got to step back. And the client is just a good person when they know that. And yep. often if they aren't and they want to be this like fat controller from the top, that's an autocratic relationship. Like, yeah, nah, you know, like yep. you, you don't see coaches exhibiting that kind of behavior yep. anymore. The whole like yep. Dennis Pagan sort of, this yep. is my dad's a, a football coach. So there's, yep, yep. there's a whole, you know, field of, of coaching that's completely changed from the eighties to now it's all sort of a lot more soft skills and a lot more emotional intelligence. So you can look for a, clients that have emotional intelligence that that's going to allow you to do your job yeah. i don't think it's necessarily like yeah yeah like architects have been like oh the client is this amorphous mass we should service them correct but also yeah. if they're jerks like <laughs> nah you know yeah. and that's maybe the whole millennial thing <laughs> yeah you're not afraid to to stand up to your client yeah in the first year i started with spring smith i earned nineteen thousand dollars like that's <laughs> Because you did a whole That's lot of gr- standing up to clients. <laughs> I had no clients, you yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. Um, no one to stand up to, was, which is good. That was gross as well. That wasn't even like profit. Yeah. Like that was, you know, yeah, yeah, that's- lean time. <laughs> and I was like, man, how hard can it be to make a graduate wage of like 55 grand or something? I was like, that's yeah, easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was quite, you know, at that time, like obviously that was, you know, I was doing all kinds of weird stuff at that point in my life straight after university, but I don't care. Yeah. You know, like my life is too short to be in this battle with someone. I know these things about myself. I know that if I give them some information and they don't receive that information, that we're going to have a fight, you know, in this, it's just, a, that's a fundamental thing. If I say, listen, I have a responsibility to the entire world here mm. to not just design every site as if it's its own piece and, you know, every decision I'm making with a conscience and I want to bring you on that journey so that you can eventually, you know, the biggest financial decision that you're going to make is one that's made with a conscience as well. Yeah. And ultimately that's the respect like, that we talk about that in planning all the time. You know, the reason that, that Sterling has lost 75 trees a week is because every developer has only been thinking about their own lot. They don't give a yeah. shit about the suburb, yeah. but we do. Yeah. And I think that is ingrained in what hiring an architect is. Yep. And so any client who wants to come along for that journey is actually truly wanting to experience architecture and to be yep. learning things in the same way that I want to learn why my lawyer or my accountant or why John from Nude is telling me to do things a different way. Anyone, you know, why I listen to podcasts, why I've listened yeah. to your podcast, Dave, oh, to listen to all you. these other architects tell me how to, how they do <laughs> things. You know, like I, I'm an open person. And yeah. I think all of our clients at the moment are open to learning as well. And so that's yeah. probably the secret. Yeah. And and this, and then I look at it as the marketing person and think like, and also the secret upside of that is that you're, you're like vocal about those things. And then that stands out because most architects don't say shit and don't have strong mm. opinions and don't believe in things or many don't. And so then you stand out from everyone else because your values are actually something that a lot of clients share, but it's not being yeah. met or being addressed by many architects. So like when they see that, it's very compelling and, and, and interesting to them. Maybe it's trustworthy as well. Yeah, because you are, you're an open I book, mean, you're very transparent. Yeah. Well, also like if I'm prepared to, or, or it's not just me again, everybody at Whispering Smith is prepared to give up their time yep. to swim to Rottnest or, you know, that was Claire's idea actually. Mm-hmm. So Claire was like, let's do this. And I was like, it's a great idea. And, you know, or we're doing this campaigning for the medium density policy and trying to, you know, help that be delivered well to the gender equality stuff. Anything we do, we're giving up our own time as human beings to make things better for other human beings, right? At its most fundamental level. And so if I was looking for a person to have on my team who's not going to fuck me over, it's that person, you know, because essentially every their high DNA they're a good person. I mean, yeah. our, we we once had a grout injector on our one of our sites who was just lovely. Yeah. And I was like, that guy is a legend. You know, <laughs> he's pumping grout under the footings of our house. But yeah. I want to be friends with him forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can just <laughs> exactly. tell. Yeah. You know, 
that he's a great person. And we, yeah, we, that's the same. With, we've got plumbers, we've got all kinds of people who work on our jobs that you just know. And you know when you, when you meet someone who's all in it for themselves as well. And yeah. so I feel like if we're going to go out there and be that person, we really have to find the equivalent client. Yeah. Otherwise, they're just going to mow us to pieces. Yeah. So then everything that you're doing is kind of sending signals, like sending up the bat signal for that particular client. That's like it is a bat signal. That's genius. It's a bat signal. That's that. that's it. Somewhere <laughs> they can see it. They can see it somewhere, and they're like, oh, finally, an architect. It's like that too. And then and then it kind of works. <laughs> yeah. I suppose I'm interested in the past and the future, and in you've obviously been doing a lot of reflection and the podcast has been helpful for that as well i imagine that you've probably developed so good for that like a lot of clarity would have come from having those discussions and kind of biggest lessons or biggest lesson or thing that you wish you had learned sooner (laughs) i guess oh that one's really good that's really good i wish i'd learned that you can't you can't beat an asshole they're better at it than you don't if you if you if you're in the room with someone you're negotiating with them they're in your office they're on your client team they're on your site just do whatever you can to get rid of them mm. like i always thought that you know if i learnt enough things about you know personality types and and all of these things that i could create a, a better environment where we could deal with all different kinds of people but that is bullshit it, like you cannot beat them they are better at it than you just yeah. get out I think I wish I wish I'd you know known it earlier. Yeah. If you get that feeling, that prickling in your skin, and you're writing emails where you're having to really restrain yourself and be like, oh god, like I shouldn't say that, or oh, like just don't deal with that person anymore. Don't waste your time. Like get out. Yeah. yeah. So even if it's a million dollar job. Yeah. As in in fees, a million dollars in fees, not worth yeah. it. Just yeah. get out. It's so interesting. I, think- I mean, I I find that cha- I think everyone finds that challenging, but. I, one thing I do appreciate about architecture is how high the stakes are for for not getting out of that, how high the stakes can be for Ugh. not getting out of that arsehole stitch situation in terms of you could be trapped in a project with, for a very long time with them. But four years we were in four, one. Yeah, four years. <laughs> but but those, it's those stakes that also make it hard to do it, right? Yeah, and so I guess the thing about being an emerging practice is that you need the money. You know, yeah, it's the you just money. need it. You need to eat, and so you you sort of and, and like in in some in this particular instance, you know, our client was a, sort of masquerading as a as a sole client who we had a good relationship with, and then the husband was the one who were dealing with all the financial mm. negotiations. who cropped up like at the end of concept design, yeah, and they just kind of swapped seats, and then we were dealing. <laughs> oh no! And I was like, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh no, this is bad. And I learn a lot from that whole whole situation. And it's basically shaped who we are now. So maybe it isn't a necessary thing that you have to go through as an emerging practice that you do have a couple of those in your in your you know, in your learning portfolio. At some point um, you take on the financial risk of going like I just have to it doesn't matter. I have to do it. Yeah. I know I'm gonna pay for this. And I did know at the time the yeah. minute I sat down and had that conversation, I was like, Well, I will burn through all my fees. It, yeah. I will make nothing out of this job. There, it's there must be have been awful, a lot of I, like you know, ten thousand dollar lessons, right? Where you were like, "This is going to cost me money. <laughs> yeah. It's going to cost me money." Or I'm like, "Ten thousand dollar lessons." I'm going to have to like leave yeah. money on the table here, but just think of it as like education. Yeah, like, that's the cost. That I, was the, the the admission fee. I think also p- the thing I've picked up the mo- one of the things I picked up the most from the podcast is. In the same way that you can do, you can deliver a percentage fee by just, you know, having a system for delivering that, like things that you say at certain points in time to guide that process into happening. You don't just turn around and go, here's a 30 grand invoice because price has gone up Yeah, by a lot. You know, you can actually control the narrative of that in the same way that we control the narrative of our, you know, incoming clients. Yeah. And you, it's, you can sit down and say to them, and this is how you get away with the guilt of having walked away and left this person in the lurch. You just point blank say, firstly, you know that it's going to blow up in your face at some point. Either it's going to blow up in your face or you're going to wear it and lose a heap of money. So essentially you have to say, and you know, maybe your emotional sanity, you have to say, we are not the right architects for you. We can't provide the service that you're looking for. We can't be the design glove that you want to shove your hand into. I'm sorry. And you know, there is a like, but there are other architects, as we've discussed, 
who just have a massive capacity to be able to deal with that. Yeah. And that's probably who that person should go to. Yeah. And so then you can sort of help them on their way and say, look, actually what you're looking for is a, is a, is a sole practitioner, hmm. someone you can work one-on-one with. You can go into the office and sit there with them all day and, and draw with them right next yeah. to you. And I am, we're really sorry, but Smith is not that we, you know, we're a team of four and we just can't provide that service and do what you can to help them on their way. Yeah. Or just leave it at that. But I think that, at some point, if you're at the point at the in initial stage of a relationship where you're feeling frustrated and it's a concept design, you're done. You're, it, like you're going to do a bad job. Yeah. And so it's really important. It's really important. I think, you know, so at some point, I reckon maybe in the third, second year of Whispering Smith, I might have even gone on the doll. <laughs> it's yeah. probably easier to do that. I, I think it's going to be so inspiring to some emerging, emerging practices just to like get them fired up to sort of stick to their guns <laughs> when they know a situation is wrong and just be like, nah, that's, that's not going to happen. Just, just yeah. maybe saving a little bit of emotional pain as well. I yeah. mean, the financial pain in the end doesn't outweigh the emotional trauma of dealing yeah. with it, you know? Yeah. I love it. Well, let's finish there. Thank you very much, Kate. It was an absolute pleasure having you on. I really appreciate it. And Thanks, maybe Dave. we'll, hopefully we'll do another episode maybe later on and sort of see how things are going. Yeah, look, you know, if you want to do a check-in on just new resident, I'd be more than we're happy gonna, to we're chat. We're going to start our own podcast. 